Christianity was for men like Donald Trump and Constantine, political dominance. It's a vehicle to drive their political ambitions. It's, it, that's all that it is. And, he, and Constantine used it to do just that. He used it as a vehicle, and his model has been followed ever since then. His model has been duplicated down through the centuries and everything else the same way. And I, I think I believe that Donald Trump does the exact same thing that Constantine did the same way. And I'll show you that by reading to you uh, the things that took place there uh, in his time and kind of get you up to speed on that. So I'm going to try to stop in one hour from right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. And Lord, we just pray that you bless us now and teach us, help us to learn. Thank you for it. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Now we'll be all over the scriptures here. Uh, I'm going to start with some reading, but we'll be over in some different scriptures because the Bible says to prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good, right? So we actually have a desire to do that very thing. We have a desire to, to prove all things. And one of those things that we have to prove is when someone says, well, they're a Christian, well, then we want them to prove it, right? Uh, we want it to be believable. And um, that's exactly what we're looking for. So let me find my notes here. I don't know how that got disappeared, but it shouldn't surprise me. All right, let's see here. Let's see. Here it is. Okay, here we go. All right. At the commencement of the 4th century of the Christian era, the Roman Empire was under the dominion of four monarchs, of whom two, Diocletian and Maximum Hercules, were of superior rank, and each distinguished by the title of Augustus, while the other two, Constantinus Chlorus and Maximus Galerius, sustained a subordinate dignity and were honored with the humbler appellation of Caesars. So at the beginning of the cent of the fourth century, we've got these these kind of four rulers that are that are going to rule for a while. They're going to split the kingdom up. But there's the importance of understanding this is that Constantine saw an advantage to taking on Christianity. He looked and he saw the winds of change that were coming, and politically he made a move that was a good political move. Okay, this 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 is what happened. Diocletian was raised to the throne in the year 284, consequently had swayed the imperial scepter 16 years, but though much addicted to superstition, he entertained no aversion to the Christians, and during this period, they had enjoyed a large portion of outward peace. Constantinus Chlorus, to whose lot it fell to exercise the sovereign power in Gaul and the western provinces, was a mild and amiable pr prince under whose government we find no traces of persecution. He had himself abandoned the absurdities of polytheism and treated the Christians with benevolence and respect. The principal offices of his palace were executed by Christians. He loved their persons and esteemed their fidelity. So there, there were some, some of these rulers, they, they liked them. They liked some of the Christians because they were honest people. And they could trust them. They weren't going to rip them off. They weren't going to take advantage of them. Right, that they're, they're, they're loyal and they're trustworthy people. This alarmed the pagan priest whose interests were so intimately connected with the continuance of the ancient superstition and who apprehending not without reason that to their great detriment the Christian religion was becoming daily more universal and triumphant through the empire addressed themselves to Diocletian, whom they knew to be a timorous and credulous disposition and by fictitious oracles and other Perfidious strategiums endeavored to engage him to persecute the Christians. So they knew he was a pagan, and they're like, well, listen, this guy, we know we can mess with him. He's kind of weak-headed, and, and we'll, just, we'll just get him to turn against the Christians. 
The treacherous arts of a selfish and superstitious priesthood failed, however, for some time to move Diocletian. Their recourse was next had to Maximin Maximinius Galerius, one of the Caesars, who had married the daughter of Diocletian, a prince whose gross ignorance of everything but military affairs was accompanied with a fierce and savage temper, which rendered him a proper instrument for executing their design. Stimulated by the malicious insinuations of the heathen priest, the suggestions of a superstitious mother, and the ferocity of his own natural temper, he importuned Diocletian in so urgent a manner for an edict against the Christians that he at length obtained the, his horrid purpose. So Moshim, Moshim writes that and says this is exactly what happened. They, they, they kind of they, they needled this guy until he did what they wanted him to do, the pagan priest. Because, see, they saw the power of Christianity rising, not because the state was enforcing it, because all these people were being saved. So what's Satan going to do? Well, I see a good work going on there. I can't stop that. Well, I have to infiltrate that. And then I have to try to mar it and hurt it and damage it from the inside. So his first trick of persecution didn't work, so now he's going to switch it. It seems to have been the practice of the Roman emperors about this time to take up their residence occasionally at Nicomedia, Nicomedia, the capital of the province of Bithynia. So anyway, so this city for its beauty and greatness has been compared to Rome, Antioch, Alexandria. Anyway, this is where, where it's happening. Now, these emperors are all kind of coming on the scene, and they're not really per wanting to persecute the Christians that bad. They're, 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 things are changing. Soon after this, a new edict was issued, though, ordering all the bishops, pastors, and public teachers throughout the empire to be apprehended and imprisoned, hoping probably that if the leaders could be once effectually silenced, their respective flocks might be easily dispersed. Nor did, it, did his inhuman policy stop there. For a third edict was presently, presently issued by which it was ordered that all sorts of torments should be employed and the most intolerable punishments resorted to in order to force the disciples of Jesus to renounce their profession and to sacrifice to the heathen gods. The consequence was that an immense number of persons became the victims of this cruel stratagem throughout every part of the Roman Empire except those who had the felicity to be placed under the mild and equitable government of Constantinus Chlorus. The shameful manner in which the multitudes of them were punished, it would be difficult to relate without violating the rules of decency. In other words, they're so disgusting he can't mention them. And in the present day would scarcely obtain credit while others were put to death after having their constancy tried by tedious and inexpressible torments. And not a few sent to the mines where they were doomed to linger out the remains of their miserable life in poverty and bondage. In the third year of this horrible persecution in A.D. 304, a fourth edict was published by Diocletian at the instigation of Galerius, commissioning the magistrates to force all Christians, without distinction of rank or sex, to sacrifice to the gods and authorizing them to employ all sorts of torments with the view of driving them to think to this act of apostasy. The diligence and zeal of the Roman magistrates in the execution of this inhumane act, edict, ultimately reduced the Christian profession to a very low ebb, for this horrid persecution lasted 10 years. So right up to the time of Constantine coming on the scene, the rigorous edicts of Diocletian were strictly and cheerfully executed by his associate Max, Maximian, who had long hated the Christians and who delighted in the acts of blood and violence. In it, in the remar in, in, it is the remark of Gibbon when speaking of Maximin and Galerius that the minds of those princes had never been enlightened by science. Education had never softened their temper. They owed their greatness to their swords. And in their most elevated fortune, they still retained their superstitious prejudice of soldiers and peasants. Maximian swayed the scepter over the provinces of Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, where he gratified his own inclination by a yielding, a rigorous obedience to the stern demands of Diocletian. So all these things are being set up in the government at this time. You, you're seeing Galerius come on the scene. He's another man that would, would, would precede Constantine. As soon after, right after Galerius would be Constantine. And then you see, now do you see how it's set up for a guy to come in and take all those thousands upon thousands of Christians that are being persecuted, and then he's going to be able to grab them, start a political party with them, and be able to rise and reign over the kingdom politically. 
because in this other providence and this other leader is persecuting them. But if he arises in the Roman Empire and he changes that, the political winds will change and and he'll be a god to them. He'll be a king to them and they'll they'll gladly accept him. So that's what was happening. Mr. Gabon has labored to diminish the number of martyrs on this trial. By the way, Gabon, he, he's a good historian in a lot of ways. But a lot of these historians, they don't like to tell the truth about all the persecution that the Baptists went through, Anabaptists went through, the Bible believers went They don't like to tell the truth about it because it makes them look bad. Just like John Fox doesn't like to tell the truth about the Protestant persecution of the Baptist, the Protestant king's persecution of the Baptists. Same reason why the reformers try to whitewash uh, Calvin's and Zwingli's uh, abuse of the, ba- of the Anabaptists and the Baptist people. Same reason why. Because they, 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 they whitewash. Same reason why Eusebius. Okay, the historian Eusebius. Eusebius, you're going to find out. Eusebius had this, okay, you can remember this. this. Some of you will laugh at this and you should. Eusebius had this kind of bromance with Constantine, okay? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, he just did. He was completely bromanced by Constantine. He just looked at starry eyes with Constantine, and he was like, he he shaded his history. He shaded everything about, about Constantine into a good light because Constantine was Arian, just like Eusebius was, <laughs> and they bordered on, on Arianism and, and false doctrine. So they, so they had this kind of, anyway, so you'll see that some of these historians did not want to be accurate about that now others that were secular historians many of them would just be blunt and tell the truth because they didn't have any skin in the game so like well i don't care this is what they did to these people right Galerius now no longer made a secret of his ambitious designs he obliged diocletian and maximian to resign the imperial dignity and got himself declared emperor of the east resigning the west for the present to constantinius chlorus at that time in britain with the ill state of whose health he was well acquainted. But divine providence was now preparing more tranquil times for the church. And in order to this, it confounded the schemes of Galerius and brought his counsels to nothing. In the year 306, Constantine Chlorus, finding his end approaching, wrote to Galerius to send him his son Constantine, who had been kept as a hostage at court. The request was refused, but coming to the ears of young Constantine and aware of the danger of his situation, he resolved to attempt his escape. And seizing a favorable moment, he made the best way of his way, f- the best of his way for Britain. And to favorable moment, he made the and and to prevent pursuit is said to have killed all the post horses on his route. He arrived at York just in time to witness the death of his father Constantinius, who had in the meantime nominated his son as as his successor and the army without waiting to consult Galerius immediately pronounced Constantine emperor of the West in the room of his father, a proceeding which must have stung the tyrant to the heart who is nevertheless obliged to submit and even to confirm the appointment with the outward marks of his approbation. So Constantine's father, his son Constantine was kidnapped by Galerius. Okay. And Galerius had him in his court. Well, Constantine escapes, run to, runs to his emperor father on the other side of the empire and gets away and then goes there and gets anointed king. Now, he knew that Galerius was against the Christians, okay? So Constantine knew that if, if he just was for the Christians, and then guess what would happen? He would probably more than likely be able to use it as a political tool and a means to an end. But divine providence, okay, so now, not long after this, A.D. 311, Galerius himself, the author of all this serious series of complicated sufferings to the Christians, was redu- reduced to the brink of the grave by a dreadful and lingering disease in which he suffered horrors that no language can express. Well, he deserved it. The frequent disappointments of his ambitious views, says Gibbon, the experience of six years of persecution and the salutary reflections which a lingering and painful distemper suggested to the mind of Galerius at length convinced him that the most violent efforts of despotism are insufficient to extirpate a whole people or to subdue their religious prejudices. So Galerius was like, no matter what I do, these Christians, they're not, I can't kill them. 
Like I tried to exterminate them like cockroaches, but I can't. Because every time we try, they just keep multiplying. Just like the Jews. Everything they tried to do, the Jews that Pharaoh tried to do, what happened? They multiplied. They got more. Why? Because when God's blessing's there, it's there. You're not going to, you can't, you can't, you could persecute, but you're never going to stop God's blessing. Right? You can make things harder, but you can't stop God. And that's what happened. So he published in his own name and in, in those of Licinius and Constantine a general edict, which after a pompous recital of the imperial titles proceed in the following manner. So here's what he said. So Galerius knows that he's lost. He can't beat Christians. He's getting ate up by worms, by the way, is what's happening. He actually, the same thing that happened with Herod. That's the same thing that happened to him. He literally got ate up with worms. Like, they said that insects were all over his body, and they said that worms ate him up. Okay? So I want you to think about that for a second. That's, right? So imagine a body infested with worms. Like, you look at them, and then insects all over their body, eating their body alive. That's how he died. Good for him. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, he murdered so many Christians. He slaughtered those poor people for no reason at all. He was a wicked, vile, disgusting tyrant that God finally took care of. Amen. Among, he said this, among the important cares which have occupied our minds for the utility of the preservation of the empire, it was our intention to correct and reestablish all things according to the ancient laws and public discipline of the Romans. We were particularly desirous of reclaiming into the way of reason and nature the deluded Christians who had renounced the religion and ceremonies instituted by their fathers and presumptuously despising the practice of antiquity had invented extravagant laws and opinions according to the dictates of their fancy and had collected a various society from the different provinces of our empire. The edicts which we have published to enforce the worship of the gods, having exposed many of the Christians to danger and distress, many having suffered death, and many more who still persist in their impious folly, being left destitute of any public exercise of religion, we are disposed to extend to those unhappy men the effects of our wanton clemency. We permit them, therefore, freely to profess their private opinions and to assemble in their conventicles without fear of molestation, provided always that they preserve a due respect to the established law and government. By another rescript, we shall signify our intentions to the judges and magistrates, and we hope that our ind indulgence will engage the Christians to offer up their prayers to the deity whom they adore for our safety and prosperity for their own and for that of the republic." So in other words, they were like, tell the Christians to pray to God to, to preserve our republic, <laughs> right? He changed. Why? Was it because he was converted? No. Galerius just knew that he wasn't winning, and he knew the political winds were changing and things. It didn't work. This important edict was issued and set up at Nicomedia on the 13th of April, 311, but the wretched Galerius did not long survive its publication, for he died about the beginning of May under torments the most excruciating, and in the nature of his complaint and manner of his death, very much resembling the case of Herod. After his death, Maximin succeeded him in the government of the provinces of Asia. In the first six months of his new reign, he affected to adopt the prudent counsels of his predecessor, and though he never condescended to secure the tranquility of the church by a public edict, he caused a circular letter to be addressed to all the governors and magistrates of the provinces, expeditioning on the imperial clemency, acknowledging the invincible obstinacy of the Christians, and directing the officers of justice to cease their ineffectual prosecutions and to connive at the secret assemblies of those enthusiasts. In consequence of these orders, says Gibbon, great numbers of Christians were released from prison or delivered from the mines. The confessors singing hymns of triumph returned into their own countries, and those who had yielded to the violence of the tempest solicited with tears of repentance their readmission into the bosom of the church. That was from the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon. So, now things are being set up for a man to come on the scene to do something about it, and that man is Constantine. The government of the Roman world, which a few years before had been administered by no less than six emperors at, at one time, now became divided between Constantine and Licinius, Licinius, who immediately granted to the Christians permission to live according to their own laws and institutions, a privilege which was still more clearly ascertained by an edict drawn up at Milan in the year 313. Now, we're not going to talk about the edict of Milan today, but we will talk about it. 
There, there, Constantine issued a lot of edicts. The Edict of Milan was a big one. The Edict against the Donatists was another big one. But let me just suffice it to say, if you believe like the people do in this room right now, like we believe, you would find out quickly that you were no friend of Constantine's. And that's just the truth. This political Christian empire that Constantine was converted to and ran was different than biblical Christianity. By this edict, every subject of the empire was allowed to profess either Christianity or paganism unmolested. It also secured the places of Christian worship and even directed the restoration of whatever property they had been disposed of by the late persecution. Unless you were a Donatist. The, the rival princes, however, were not long in seeking or finding occasion to turn their arms against each other in the issues of which Licinius fell and left his competitor in the undisturbed possession of the empire. So Licinius was killed by Constantine. No character had been exhibited to posterity in lights more contradictory and irreconcilable than that of Constantine. Christian writers, transported with his profession of their faith, have magnified his, okay, let me stop there. Let, let, let me, you see what he said there? By his profession of faith, they were romance kind of by his profession of faith. How many times have you seen these giddy pastors talk about Donald Trump and, and see how they, they have this bromance over him and they like lush over him and they act like he's like, like if there was a picture of Christianity, like Donald Trump's name should be right next to it and he's the most godly man, just like Brother Bush was, the most godly man anywhere, right, George Bush, and these people, and they gush over their testimonies. I'm like, but they're hollow! There's nothing to them! They're, they're not Christians. They don't believe the Bible and they certainly don't follow it. But nevertheless, because they said Jesus' name and they did a few good things, they're automatically great Christian people. And you just got to give them a chance, brother. You got to give the Lord a chance to work on them and, and, and everything else. Because, I mean, that's you just got to give them a chance. You're not perfect and you got saved. So, I mean, they're not either. And that's the kind of things you hear. Right. That's the You're not. So, so Donald Trump, you should believe his profession just because he said he was one. Like you should believe Constantine because he did some good things. That's how it is. Oh, man, I got to keep moving. The circumstances. I like this. The circumstances attending his conversion to. By the way, you can always tell when a Baptist is writing this and somebody else, and a Protestant that is gushing over Constantine writes it. Because the, the Protestants that gush over Constantine, they literally act like the guy was, like, sinless. And they overlook every everything that he did, and from the names that he called himself, which we'll get to, and all those other things, and they say, well, well, if that's what you got converted to, brother, then I, I'm not sure you're converted. I'll just be honest. If Constantine's Christianity is what you got converted to, I'm not so sure you're converted then. That's how different Constantine's profession was. But I'll show you. See, I like to show you these things. I don't want to just tell you. I want to show you. And that's why I have to labor through this stuff and read through it. Why? Because some guy out there is going to say, if you just said, well, Constantine's not a Christian, and you don't back it up and prove it and put the history in place and all that other stuff, nobody will believe you. That's like, yeah, whatever. I want to be able to go, well, just listen to it and find out. Listen to them in their own words. That's why I give their own words. What they say and what they do. The circumstances attending his conversion to Christianity are too familiar to most readers to render anything like a minute detail of them proper in this place. His father, Constantinius, had shown himself very favorably disposed towards the Christians, and Constantine gave early indications of a desire to protect and favor its professors. If we may credit his own assertion, he had been an indignant spectator of the savage cruelties which had been inflicted by the hands of the Roman soldiers on those citizens whose religion was their only crime. Okay, so it sounds a lot like Constantine. Constantine, or like Trump, because Trump has seen what? He, he watched some Christians be treated poorly. And remember, Trump's a white American male, all right? Old school, 70-year-old dude that likes America. He really does. There's different guys in the New World Order. There's the kind that like America and the kind that hate America. He's the kind that likes America. So if anybody's going to rule the world, it's going to be him and his posterity. 
Whether that's antichrist or not has nothing to do with it. Okay? But when he sees Christians being picked on, he doesn't like it. Why? Because he, he sees the change in America that's going on, and he doesn't like it. Do you understand? That's, that's, the, that's the political aspect of it. And that's what people miss with this whole thing. They miss the, that there's a political aspect to this completely. And that's what happened here. And by the way, whenever you marry Christianity to politics, go ahead and put a fork in it. It ain't nothing but a big, fat, stinking whore. That's what it is. Thank you. Some of you will get that. Some of you won't. But I'll say it again. Let me turn up the volume. Anytime you take biblical Christianity and you mix it with politics, it's just a great, big, stinky, nasty whore is all it is. Amen. Because that is what it is. That's what God called it. Amen. See, because the real Christians, they get persecuted when Constantine and Donald Trump and everybody else pick up the sword. They're the ones that get persecuted, not the fake ones, not, not, not the corporate Christianity, not those. They never do. I'm telling you what, there's such a bastardized Christianity taught today in America. It's just so, it's, it's so unbelievable. People are so ignorant of history, so absolutely ignorant of it. So Constantine didn't like seeing those people killed, which is good. I mean, normal you wouldn't, right? These tolerant principles were displayed alike both towards pagans and Christians before the emperor had avowed any peculiar attachment toward the latter. It is true, nevertheless, that he did not always maintain this state of indifference. He appears evidently to have been convinced of the folly and impiety of pagan superstition, which induced him to exhort all his subjects earnestly to embrace the gospel and at length to employ all the force of his authority to abolish the ancient heathen worship politically with the sword. According to his own account, he was, he was marching at the head of his army from France into Italy against Maxentanius and on an expedition which he was fully aware involved in it his future destiny. Oppressed with the extreme anxiety and reflecting that he needed a force superior to arms for subduing the sorceries and magic of his adversary, he anxiously looked out for the aid of some deity at that which alone could secure him success. He's looking for a deity. About noon, when the sun began to decline, whilst praying for supernatural aid, a luminous cross was seen by the emperor and his army in the air above the sun, inscribed with the words, by this conquer. At the sight of which, amazement overpowered both himself and the soldiery on the expedition with him. He continued to ponder on the event till night, when in a dream the author of Christianity appeared to him. To confirm the vision, directing him at the same time to make the symbol of the cross his military ensign. Okay, so let's back up here. So, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Okay? Jesus said, you know not what. Okay, but he told Constantine, kill them all, Constantine. Really? I believe I'd be trying the spirits whether they have God. <laughs> I, th I think I'd be doing that. I think that'd be I think that'd be a good idea. I think I'd be trying wait a minute. Now how's that balance with what the New Testament says? So here's and, and let me help you, because I'm gonna give you a lot of opinions on this and I gotta hurry. I, I'm going to give you a lot of different opinions on, or a few different opinions on this, okay? But here's the thing. There's speculation. Did he really see this? I am under the impression that he did see this. I am also under the impression that that someone named Jesus did, called that called himself Jesus, did visit him. I believe he really did see that in the sky. See, I don't have a problem with that because I can... I, I can show you in my Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 1. I, I can show you where God says, well, that'll happen. Right? Verse number 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, unto you let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel 
unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Well, yeah, there's an angel that can come to you, and there's one that can, and there's ones that can show you signs and lying wonders, and there's ones that can give you a different message other than this book. That is absolutely 1,000% possible. And I have an answer for all these men are speculating. Well, maybe he didn't see it. Maybe he made it up. Maybe he was just tired. Maybe he had anxiety. Maybe this. No, I think he saw it. And the demonic way that he did what he did and the Antichrist rise of that beast system and what he bastardized Christianity into a corporate structure and everything he did, I absolutely believe he saw devils. I absolutely believe he thought that was Jesus. I do think that. I do. I do think that it was real, like it really happened. Why Why is that hard for people to believe? It's not for me. I, I believe he actually, like if he sat down and told you that story, it's believable. I, I think he saw it. Sure do. How can you explain the demonic way that he took over that empire and the way that he did things? And who he persecuted? And how and the ability to deceive with that antichrist spirit that he had. Even the elect, if it were possible. Okay. Few things have occasioned more perplexity to the writers of ecclesiastical history and set more at variance than the vision of Constantine. Mr. Milner, whose credulity on most occasions is sufficiently apparent, entertains no doubt of the reality of the miracle, and such in his inconsistency with his own theological creed that he resolves in it an answer to Constantine's importunate prayer. He prayed, he implored, says he, with much vehemence and importunity, and God left him not unanswered. Jones says this as a Baptist. He says, as though the blessed God would listen to any prayer but that of faith. It wasn't a prayer of faith. He didn't even say who he was praying to. He wasn't praying to God of the Bible. Where does it say that he was doing that? The learned Moshim is, is evidently perplexed about it and seems at a loss in what light to consider it, and so also is his translator. The whole story, says the latter, is attended with difficulties which render it both as a miracle and as a fact, extremely dubious to say no more. If any should think the subject worthy of further investigation, I would recommend, anyway, he recommends some book that you should uh, read. I'm going to read to you the account of, which we're going to be in mostly here, in Schaff's history, because there's a, there's a further account of it and a little bit more about Constantine, and I'm going to tell you kind of what he did and his testimony and everything else like that. The whole story is replete with contradictions in that there exists a presumptuous diametrically opposite to the intent of the alleged miracle in the declaration of Christ to the Roman governor. Now, what did I tell you to remember? Uh, what did I tell you was the principle that you had to remember as we moved forward into this when we talked about Constantine and the kingdom and everything else? What was the main phrase that I told you that you must remember? That what was not of this world? Christ's kingdom was not of this world. And why is that important? Well, because the Jesus that visited Constantine said that his kingdom was of this world. Right? Right? Shouldn't that bother you if Jesus told his disciples and Pilate, the Roman province at the time, that my kingdom is not of this world or my soldiers or my, my disciples would fight? But Constantine now comes up and he says, well, Jesus came to me and told me in this sign, conquer. Well, I think another Jesus came to you. I do. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And that in a word, the powerful inducements of policy and party, the obvious character of Constantine, and the opinions of the times, when judiciously considered and properly combined, presented themselves an easy solution to the whole contrivance and fraud. Constantine, listen, most of your charismatics and all of your people that, that, that have visions and everything else, how come their visions and everything else teach them something contrary to the written word of God? Because they're that other spirit that, they were that we were warned about. You don't have to sit around and argue with people whether they saw a vision and, and, or, or they saw a 
a or they they heard a vision or they saw a vision or they had a dream. I got no problem. I believe you. But if it goes contrary to this book, I don't really care what it said. Your vision can go to hell. Amen. Because that's where it came from. Constantine vanquishes adversary. So what happened right away? He vanquished his adversary. No sooner was he made master of Rome by the destruction of Maxentinius that he on. Are you ready? <laughs> this is going to start to get. This is going to. This is where it starts to get gooder. Okay. Remember that word. Constantine vanquished his adversary, and no sooner was he made master of Rome by the destruction of Maxentinius than he honored the cross by putting a spear of that form into the hand of the statue erected for him at Rome. He now built places for Christian worship and showed great benevolence, beneficence to the poor. He encouraged the meeting of bishops and synods, honored them with his presence. Oh, what an honor. And employed himself continually in aggrandizing the church. He removed the seat of the empire to Byzantinium, what, which he embellished, enlarged, and honored with the name of Constantinople, and prohibited by a severe edict the performance of any pagan rites and ceremonies throughout the city. His religious zeal augmented with his years, and towards the close of his life, several imperial edicts were issued for the demolition of the heathen temples and the prevention of any sacrifice upon their altars. He was, on the other hand, scrupulously attentive to the religious rites and ceremonies which were prescribed by the Christian clergy. He fasted, observed the feast and commemorative commemoration of the martyrs, and devoutly watched the whole nights in, on the vigils of the saints. And in his late at last illness, he summoned to the imperial palace of Nicodemia several Christian bishops, fervently requesting to receive from them the ordinance of baptism and solemnly protesting his intention of spending the remainder of his life as the disciple of Christ. Well, he was on his deathbed. And right at the end, I'm going to get baptized because it's going to wash away my sins, but I'm going to wait all the way to the end of my life. So then the washing is thorough, and then I just die. Yeah, that doesn't sound like somebody that understood the gospel. He was accordingly baptized by Eusebius. Oh, there's not a contradiction there. A bishop of that city after which he entirely laid aside his purple and regal robes and continued to wear a white garment till the day of his death, which after a short illness took place on the 22nd of May in the year 337 at the age of 64, having reigned 33 years. You can't make it up. You really can't. I just <laughs> right? If you try to make it up, you just can't. It just, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to get into this book here. Oh, I'm not done. There's much more. Because i got to explain to you his testimony. I think it's important for you to understand any man that says he's the first Christian emperor. Right? I mean, we ought we to ought definitely know his testimony, right? Since it's the emperor, we should know all about him, right? All right, so now what we're going to do is read a little bit more in depth. I'm going to skip some of these things that, that are not necessary here that we've already talked about. Let's see. Okay. Now, Schaff borders on Catholicism for sure, re re reformed type Catholicism. But nevertheless, he has a lot of good points and a lot of things that he that he takes from Moshim, he takes from a few others, uh, and he took good history. I mean, he had, he had a lot of good history, so record a lot. But we could take from his facts and the things that he says and just be like, okay, well, <laughs> we definitely know that's not what the Bible says. In judging of this remarkable man and his reign, we must by all means keep to the great historical principle that all representative characters act conscientiously or unconscientiously as the free and responsible organs of the spirit of their age, which molds them first before they can mold it in turn, and that the spirit of the age itself, whether good or bad, is mixed with, is but an instrument in the hands of divine providence, which rules and overrules all the actions and motives of men. So, he's trying to make excuses for Constantine, basically. There was no excuse. The Donatists and others that had a good testimony would prove what biblical Christianity was. Very clearly. All right. Uh, he was distinguished by that. He was distinguished 
by that genuine political wisdom, which putting itself at the head of the age clearly saw that idolatry had outlived itself in the Roman Empire and that Christianity alone could breathe new vigor into it and furnish its moral support. Especially on the point of the external Catholic unity, his monarchical politics accorded with the hierarchical episcopacy of the church. Hence, from the year 313, he placed himself in close connection with the bishops, made peace and harmony his first object in the Donatist and Arian controversies. Well, I wouldn't agree with that. And applied the predicate Catholic to the church in all official documents. And as his predecessors were supreme pontiffs of the heathen religion of the empire, so he desired to be looked upon as a sort of bishop, a universal bishop of external affairs of the church. All this by no means from mere self-interest, <laughs> but for the good of the empire, which now shaken to its foundations and threatened by barbarians on every side, could only by some new bond of unity be consolidated and upheld until at least the seeds of Christianity and civilization should be planted among the barbarians themselves. His personal policy thus coincided with the interests of the state. In other words, he rode the coattails of Christianity for a purpose. His, uh, let's see here. Christianity appeared to him, as it proved in fact, the only efficient power for a political reformation of the empire, from which the ancient spirit of Rome was, was fast departing, while internal civil and religious dissensions and the outward pressure of the barbarians threatened a gradual dissolution of society. So in other words, again, it was a vehicle for him to rule the empire. But with the political, he united also religious motive. What, what happened there? Well, he took his political, and he took Catholic Christianity as a whole, and he combined them together. He was not ignorant of what he had done. It was a plan. He did it on purpose. His whole family, oh wait, let me back up. But with, politi with the political, he united also religious motive, not clear and deep, indeed, yet honest and strongly infused with the superstitious disposition to judge of a religion by its outward success and to ascribe a magical virtue to signs and ceremonies. His whole family was swayed by religious sentiment, which manifested itself in different forms. In the devout pilgrimages of Helena, the fanatical Arianism of Constantinia and Constantinius, and the fanatical paganism of Julian the Apostate. I mean, you'd almost think they were all a bunch of witches. That's what you would almost think. Like, they were just all different flavor of witch. Constantine adopted Christianity first as a superstition. And put it by, si by the side of his heathen superstition, till finally in his conviction the Christian vanquished the pagan, though without itself developing into a pure and enlightened faith. So basically what he's saying is he wasn't really a Christian. At first, Constantine, like his father, in the spirit of the Neoplatonic syncretism of dying heathenism, reverenced all the gods as mysterious powers, especially Apollo, the god of the sun, to whom in the year 308 he presented magnificent gifts. Nay, listen, listen. As so late as the year 321, he enjoined regular consultation of the soothsayers. In public misfortunes, according to ancient heathen usage, even later, he placed his new residence, Byzantinium, under the protection of the god of the martyrs and the heathen goddess of fortune. This is your Christian emperor. So like when like president when the presidents go go up there and then they have like all these what, what was the last like the ceremonies that they observe at Kwanzaa and all these other things they're observing and they're recognizing all these gods and then you have the president's pastor Paula White this week going to the Moonies not the movies the Moonies you know who the Moonies are no not no no 
the Moonies are a bunch of nuts that have a false messiah, and she's called Mother Moon, and she was preaching, th- this lady was, and she was preaching, they're the, the fake messiah, the, and uh, basically, they're, a, they're a cult. And now you have, what is, by the way, who, who recognizes something here? What was, what was Constantine doing when he placed, the pr- under the protection, the god of the martyrs and the heathen goddess of fortune? What is that? Yes, why? There's a male and there's a female. It's the same what? What do we call that? Yes, but what else do we call that in, in, in Revelation? What is it? It's what Rome is called. Babylon. Babylon, Babylon. That's all it is. That's, ba- that's what Babylon is. That's the spirit of the goddess. What's that? Mystery Babylon the Great. That's what it is. That's what he did. He did the same thing. By the way, that was 321 after he saw the flaming cross. Right, and started killing people like a good Christian would. Look, I want you people, I want you people to die. Anybody remember that lady? <laughs> that was the Christmas spirit. Oh, this, this gets better, though, or gooder. However you look at it. Are you ready for the next one? Because this one's even better. This one's even better. Under the protection, right, we talked about the god of martyrs and the heathen goddess of fortune. This must be just a coincidence. And down to the end of his life, he retained the title and the dignity of Pontifex Maximus. Or high priest of the heathen hierarchy. What does the pope call himself? Pontifex Maximus. He calls himself the same thing. Hmm. But it actually, but wait, there's more. Th- this gets better. Are, is anybody recognizing the Babylonian spirit here and the fact that none of this is biblical Christianity? Okay, okay, listen. Here, here it goes. Here's better. His coins bore on one side the letters of the name of Christ, on the other the figure of the sun god, S-U-N slash G-O-D, and the inscription, Sol Invictus. What in the world is that? Oh, that, I'm glad you asked. Sol Invictus is the unconquered sun, was the official sun god of the latter Roman Empire and the patron of soldiers. On December 25th, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Babylon. Should that be my broadcast tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, stop it. No. Oh, no. My computer's going dead. All right. I knew it was a trap. How could I have lost 45% that quick? There's no way. Okay, anyway, on December 25th, AD 274, the Roman Empire Aurelian, Emperor Aurelian, made it an official religion alongside the traditional Roman cults. Oh, that was nice of him. Scholars disagree about whether the new deity was a refoundation of the ancient Latin cult of Sol, a revival of the cult of Elagabalus, or completely new. <laughs> the god was favored by emperors after Aurelian and appeared on their coins until the last third part of the reign of Constantine. The last inscription referring to Sol Invictus dates 387, and there were enough devotees in the in the 5th century that the Christian theologian Augustine found it necessary to preach against them. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because his emperor did it, the guy he liked. But anyway, we'll keep going. Sol Invictus. By the way, I've seen a guy with that on his... That was weird. Of course, these inconsistencies may be referred also to policy and accommodation to the toleration edict of 313. Yeah, because, you know, I know Christians that put, like, Sol Invictus on one side, a pagan god, and they put the goddess of fortune on the other side, and that's what they do. That's most biblical Christians like to do that. Right. Right. Nor is it difficult to adduce parallels of persons who, in passing for Judaism, so he's trying to he's trying to whitewash. He goes, "Well, look, some Jews did some things that weren't right too." I'm sorry, Shaf, that doesn't work. Not when you call yourself the Christian emperor, right? Anyway, 
With his every victory over his pagan rivals, Galerius, Maxentinius, and Licinius, his personal leaning to Christianity and his confidence in the magic power of the sign of the cross increased. Yes. That's who they are. They're, they are Constantine soldiers. Yet he did not formally renounce heathenism and did not receive baptism until in 337 he was laid upon the bed of death. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I like this next part. He had an imposing and winning person. <laughs> You have a winning personality. <laughs> and was compared by flatterers with Apollo. See, I'm telling you, Eusebius had a bromance with the guy. He was tall, broad-shouldered, handsome, and of a re remarkably vigorous and healthy constitution. But given to excessive vanity in his dress and outward demeanor, always wearing an oriental diadem, a helmet studded with jewels, and a purple mantle of silk richly embroidered with pearls and flowers worked in gold. <laughs> Lincoln. Lee's comment, he was gay. His mind was not highly cultivated, but naturally clear and strong, and shrewd was seldom, th seldom thrown off its guard. He is said to have combined a cynical contempt of mankind with an inordinate love of praise. He possessed a good knowledge of human nature and administrative energy and tact. His moral character was not with, without noble traits, among which a chastity rare for the time, and liberality and beneficiality. A beneficence bordering on wastefulness were prominent. He sounds like Trump. That's what I wrote here on my notes, by the way. <laughs> Many, that's, I just wrote that in there. Many of his laws and regulations breathed the spirit of Christian justice and humanity, promoted the elevation of the female sex. Wait, does this sound familiar? Who hired more women in his, in his administration than anyone? Trump. improved the condition of slaves and of unfortunates, and gave free play to the efficiency of the church throughout the whole empire. Altogether, he is one of the best, the most fortunate, and most influential of the Roman emperors, Christian and pagan. Yet he had great faults. He was far from being so pure and so venerable as Eusebius, blinded by his favor to the church, depicts him in his bombastic and almost dishonestly eulogistic biography with the evident intention of setting him up as the model for all future Christian princes. Yeah. It must with all regret be conceded that his progress in the knowledge of Christianity was not a progress in the practice of its virtues. Oh, you mean like Christianity didn't change him? Yeah, like he wasn't sanctified. Like he had a gospel that didn't change him and he was just the same old wicked pagan as always. And he just added Christianity to his paganism. His love of display in his prodigality, his suspiciousness and his despotism increased with his power. That doesn't sound like Christianity. Does it? The very brightest period of his reign is stained with gross crimes, which even the spirit of the age and the policy of an absolute monarch cannot excuse. After having reached upon the bloody path of war, well, yeah, because that's what Christians do. They just go out and kill people, and in the name of the cross, I'll slit your throat. The goal of his ambition, the solo possession of the empire, yea, in the very year in which he summoned the great council of Nicaea, he ordered the execution of his conquered rival and brother-in-law, Licinius, in a breach of solemn promise of mercy. What did he do? He was so Christian that he tricked his brother-in-law into believing that he wasn't going to kill him, set him up, and then killed him. That's some natural affection. Not satisfied with this, he caused soon afterwards, from political suspicion, the death of the young Licinius, his nephew, a boy of hardly 11 years. That is so godly. <laughs> I could just, can you, like, feel the Christian love? What's wrong with you? Don't you people know that Constantine loved people? God loves everybody except you, loser. You're just an 11-year-old boy. You're dead. I am just don't like you. You're too ambitious. I'm going to kill you. That's normal, right, for people to kill 11-year-olds? That's What's so unchristian about that? What's wrong with you? He said Jesus loves you and then killed him. I mean, what's wrong with that? 
What's wrong with you people? You don't know. He might have repented right after that, you know. Wait, no, he didn't. I guess he. But the worst of all, wait, that wasn't the worst? Wait, no, that wasn't the worst. You mean there is more? You mean out of our Christian emperor? Constantine, the greatest Christian of all emperors and a most godly, beautiful man that he was and, and, and you know, broad shoulders, handsome man. Thanks again. I think this is, okay, so maybe you could be like, okay, I can understand why he'd kill the, uh, the emperor over there and, you know, take charge. Maybe you could make an excuse for that. Maybe God told him to slit that other Christian guy that claimed to be a Christian guy that had religious toleration for the Christians over there. Maybe, maybe God told him to do that. And then maybe, just maybe, God told him to kill his 11-year-old nephew. Because that was a little far away. So, I mean, it's just his nephew, right? I mean, it's just his nephew. But the worst of all is the murder of his eldest son. Crispus, in 326, who had incurred the suspicion of political conspiracy and of adulterous and incestuous purposes towards his stepmother, Fausta, but it is generally regarded as innocent. So they set him up. All they had to do was say he did that, so then guess what? Guess what would happen? Well, none of the Christians would complain that Constantine killed the wall. He's a... He's a Incestual little pervert. Kill him. Kill your son, Constantine. He's a pervert. So what Christian what Christian in, in that Roman Empire is going to argue with that that's close to him? Certainly not Eusebius. Kill them all. In this sign, kill everybody. When Jesus said he came to save life, not to destroy it, but not Constantine's Jesus. Constantine's Jesus told him to kill them all. Right? And let God sort them out. You ever heard that one before? That's what, that's what the Roman pontiffs did to the Waldensians. When they had the Waldensians there and they had Catholics mixed and the guard looked at him and said, but... But Bishop, there's 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 Catholics in here. Kill them all. Let God sort them out. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Make those brown people glass over there. Right? Right? By the way, did you know that many of the Baptists lived peaceably with the Muslims in their countries, and the Muslims never tried to kill them? You know the only time most Muslims tried to kill Christians? You know, like, really, the, when Rome got involved, and those guards got involved, and then, and then white people in Congress got involved, and Pentagon people got involved? Then Muslims make things go boom. But did you know they dwelt together in many lands? The Donatists dwelt with those people in a lot of times, and other groups of people dealt with those Muslims, and they dwelt among them. No, they didn't believe in their religion, and yes, they preached, and yes, they preached the truth and preached the truth against them. Prob but you know what? They didn't kill each other. Yeah, you don't have to kill them, you know. They can be wrong. You don't have to kill them. Yeah. This domestic and, and political tragedy emerged from a vortex of mutual suspicion and rivalry. Eusebius justifies this procedure towards an enemy of the Christians by the laws of war. But what becomes of the breach of a solemn pledge? The murder of Crispus and Fausta he passes over in a prudent silence in violation of the highest duty of the historian to relate the truth and the whole truth. In other words, he whitewashed Constantine's murder. Just like Christians do Trump. They just whitewash what he did. Or Bush invading Iraq and killing all those people. Well, what did we do that for? What, 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 wait, what did we do that for? Like, what did they have to do with 9-11? Nothing. We just like killing people. What did they do? Did Iraq send people over here and, and they, they came into the Trade Center? No, those were white people that sent those people over there. Those, those weren't Iraqis. Those are people in Pentagon, people in places like that. Oh, you don't believe those things. Oh, I absolutely do. 
Oh, I absolutely do. Because if you ever do any research at all, you'll find out that, the, like I said, the only Muslims that make things go boom are the ones that are connected to the FBI. What is that connection for? Or CIA, that's right. Or Bush. Or Dick Cheney. Or Ronald, or or um, or or Bush, when they tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan, or Abraham Lincoln, or he reestablished ties to the Vatican. Really quick after that, yeah. Well, they're serious about that. This domestic and political tragedy emerged from a vortex of mutual suspicions. Okay, uh, let's see here. He says, later authors assert, though gratuitously, that the emperor, like David, bitterly repented of his sin. Funny, I've never seen anything about it. He has been frequently charged, besides, though it would seem together unjustly, with the death of his second wife, Fausta, in 326. Ah, kill her, too. What'd she do? I don't know, just kill her. Who, after 20 years of happy wedlock... <laughs> is said to have been convicted of slandering her stepson Crispus and of adultery with a slave or one of the imperial guards, and then to have been suffocated in the vapor of an overheated bath. So you mean he got suicided? She did? Yeah, he is a little bit, isn't he? But the accounts of the cause and manner of her death are so late and discordant as to make Constantine's part in the least very doubtful. Not to me. At all events, Christianity did not produce in Constantine a thorough moral transformation. Well, I sure hope it does in you. <laughs> Otherwise, you might kill me. <laughs> right? Or you might kill your wife, I guess. I don't know. I, you know what? You're going to memorize this week my life verse. See, maybe you know that already. What's that? Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't make it that easy for him. I won't make him that easy. Right? I got to make it a little bit harder. But um, anyway, the um, as Constantine here, as Constantine uh, continued on to his... Um, his slaughterhouse uh, religion that was truly a slaughterhouse religion, right? We, we come to a place uh, where there's no excuse that can be given for his, for his uh, wickedness. All events, it says, at all events, Christian did not produce in Constantine a, a thorough moral transformation. He was concerned more to advance the outward social position of the Christian religion than <clears throat> outward, look at this, he was concerned more to advance the outward social position of the Christian religion than to further its inward mission. Yes. He was praised and censured in turn by the Christians and pagans, the Orthodox and the Arians, as they successfully experienced his favor or dislike. He bears some resemblance to Peter the Great, both in his public acts and his private character, by combining great virtues and merits with monstrous crimes. And he probably died with the same consolation as Peter, whose last words were, I trust and respect of the good I have striven to do my people, the church, God will pardon my sins. Really? Is that how you're going to die? Man, I hope not, because I'm in a lot of trouble if that's how I die. Well, I hope that's true Catholic doctrine, isn't it? I hope my good outweighs my bad before I die. Well, let me help you. It won't. Because all your righteousness is as filthy rags. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. This man did not know the gospel. It is quite characteristic of his piety that he turned the sacred nails. Are you ready? He turned the sacred nails of the Savior's cross, which Helena brought from Jerusalem, the one into the bit of, of his war horse. Does anybody really believe they actually had the nails? The other into an ornament of his helmet. 
So you mean like he was kind of like Hitler? He gathered all those things together? Right? He gathered all those things together, and the reason he gathered them together was what? To get some magical power? Right. Think about that. He, he gathers them all up and uses them as like relics of power. Not a decided, pure, and consistent character, he stands on the line of transition between two ages and two regions, and his life bears plain marks of both. When at least on his deathbed he submitted to baptism with the remark, now let us cast away all duplicity. Wait a minute, so you plan that, and like the hour of your death you plan, and you said, let us cast away all duplicity. Now I'm going to get serious about God. So the whole fiery cross that you saw, the whole, like, all, all that didn't make you serious about God? No, because signs never make people serious about God. You don't get serious about God till you get born again by the Spirit of God, till you get changed supernaturally. And then guess what? Then you'll be a different creature, won't you? You won't be the same. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ changes you, right? He makes you new. That's what happens. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You think about that one. I got some more for you here, but hang on. For these general remarks, we turn to the leading features of Constantine's life and reign as far as they bear upon the history of the church. We shall consider in his order his youth, his training, the vision of the cross, and the edict of toleration. Okay, so uh, Constantine, I'm not going to read all this to you, but uh, his mother was Helena, the daughter of an innkeeper, the first wife of Constantinus, afterwards divorced when Constantinus, of political reasons, married a daughter of Maximian. She is described by Christian writers as a discreet and devout woman and has been honored with a place in the catalog of the saints. Her name is identified with the discovery of the cross and the pious superstitions of the holy places. It's like, you know how Rome, had, what, what's that? There's a catalog of saints, like Sears catalog. Nobody gets Sears catalog anymore. Although that would be a mighty weapon. If you threw that at somebody, you would definitely knock somebody out. Sears catalog used to be ridiculously heavy. You remember that? You could, like, knock people out with that thing. She lived to a very advanced age and died in the year 326 in or, in or near the city of Rome. Rising by her beauty and good fortune from obscurity to the splendor of the court, then meeting the fate of Josephine, but restored to imperial dignity by her son and ending as a saint of the Catholic Church. Oh. Helena would form an interesting subject for a historical novel. Well, not for me. But anyway, uh, we won't go into that. Let's see here. I'm going to keep going here. There's some high points I want to get to here. Okay, I want you to listen to this because here, here's the thing. That, that One of the things that influenced Constantine. He said this. He reasoned, as Eusebius reports from his own mouth, in the following manner. My father revered the Christian God and uniformly prospered, while the emperors who worshipped the heathen gods died a miserable death. Therefore, that I may enjoy a happy life and reign, I will imitate the example of my father and join myself to the cause of the Christians, who are growing daily while the heathen are diminishing. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. When his mother, whether his mother, whom he always revered and who made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in her 80th year, planted the germ of the Christian faith in her son, as Theodore supposes, or herself became a Christian, though through his influence, as Eusebius asserts, must remain undecided. According to the heathen Zosimus, whose statement is unquestionably false and malicious, an Egyptian who came out of Spain, probably the Bishop of Hosius of Cordova, a native of Egypt, is intended, persuaded him after the murder of Crispus, which did not occur before 326, that by converting to Christianity, he might obtain forgiveness of his sins. The first public evidence of a positive leaning towards the Christian religion. Anyway, so we, we, we'll, I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to continue on and give you some other uh, points here about his, his rule and reign here. Are you starting to figure out how this is not biblical Christianity? 
that what Constantine held to was not biblical Christianity at all? Here belongs the familiar story of the miraculous cross. The precise day and place cannot be fixed. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit. I don't want to rehash that. Uh, But understand that Constantine's interest in Christianity was only for, for gain. He counted gain as godliness. The occurrence is variously described as not without serious difficulties. Anyway, uh, some of those men, they differ on what they believe happened with him. In which the emperor was directed, it is not stated by whom, whether by Christ or by an angel, to stamp on the shields of his soldiers the heavenly sign of God, that is the cross, with the name of Christ, and thus to go forth against his enemy. Eusebius, on the contrary, gives a more minute account on the authority of a subsequent private communication of the age Constantine himself under oath, not, however, till the year 338, a year after the death of the emperor, his only witness in 26 years after the event. So... I don't know. He had Sol Invictus on one side. He had the sun god, and then he had that. He actually had that cross with the sword in it, which I can't show you because my computer's dead. But anyway, it's a symbol that he had on there. Okay, let's see here. The emperor, whilst earnestly praying to the true God for light and help at this critical time, saw together with his army in clear daylight towards evening a shining cross in the heavens above the sun with the inscription, By this conquer. And in the following night, Christ himself appeared to him while he slept and directed him to have a standard prepared in the form of this sign of the cross and that to proceed against Max Antinius and all other enemies. Kill them all. The account of Eusebius, or rather of Constantine himself, adds to the night dream of Lactanius, the preceding vision of the day, and the direction concerning the standard, while Lactanius, Lactanius speaks of the inscription of the, of the initial letters of Christ's name on the shields of the soldiers. Yep, according to Rufinus, a latter historian who elsewhere dis- depends entirely on Eusebius and can therefore not be regarded as a proper witness in the case, the sign of the cross appeared to Constantine in a dream, which agrees with the account. And upon his awaking in terror, an angel exclaimed to him, Hoc Vince. That's what he explained to him. And Rufinus are the only Christian writers of the 4th century who mention the apparition. But we have besides one or two heathen testimonies, which, though vague and obscure, still serve to strengthen the evidence in favor of some actual occurrence. The the contemporaneous orator Nazareth, in a panegyric upon the emperor, pronounced March 1st, 321, apparently at Rome, speaks of an army of divine warriors and divine assistance which Constantine received in the engagement with Maxentinius, but he converts it to the service of heathenism by reoccurring to old prodigies such as the appearance of Castor and Pollux. Those are gods. So people call it, some people call it a miracle. Some people don't. Turn to Acts chapter 26, verse number 14. I want you to notice the difference in something. And when we were, fa- verse number 14, when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Those are your other two verses, 14 and 15. Acts 26, 14 and 15. Those should be easy, way easier than last week's. Okay, so there's three total. Now, what's the difference in this vision and the other one? Well, before this, Paul was killing people. After this, Paul stopped killing people. Right? What happened with Constantine? After his vision, he started killing people. Total opposite, right? 
Think about that. One says it this way. We should suppose, moreover, that Christ, if he had really appeared to Constantine, either in person or through angels, would have exhorted him to repent and be baptized rather than to construct a military and sign for a bloody battle. Why is it that all these visions and everything that happens, they always appear and don't tell people they need to be saved by the grace of God and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sin, but it's always something extraordinary and crazy. What happened with Paul's vision? He got saved. That's not what happened with Constantine. Constantine, he saw devils. And what did he do? Killed. That's what he did. Right? And I happen to believe that that's exactly. Constantine and his friends referred the most important facts of his life as the knowledge of the approach of hostile armies, the discovery of the Holy Sepulcher, the founding of Constantinople to divine revelations through visions and dreams. Nor are we disposed to the least to deny the connection of the vision of the cross with the agency of divine providence, which controlled this remarkable turning point of history. We may go farther and admit a special providence or what the old divines called providentia, but this does not necessarily imply a violation of the order of nature or an actual miracle in the shape of an object, objective personal appearance of the Savior. Really? Because I want to show you something. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to show you something here. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 8 says, And last of all, he was seen of me. Also as one born out of due time. Who was the last one to see Jesus Christ coming? Paul. Born out of due time. Now, you might say, well, what about John in the Revelation? John was already an apostle. John had already seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. Paul was the only one to see him as one born out of due time. He said, and last of all, me. Me. Last of all, he was seen of me. As of one born out of due time. Constantine did not see the Jesus of the Bible. That's what scripture says. I don't care what these guys that have a bromance with Constantine say. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Because his fruit, Constantine's fruit was antichrist. Look at Luke chapter 9. Verse 54 to 56. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Well, I think that doesn't sound like the same Jesus, does it? When these men saw Jesus, it changed their life. By the way, does anybody wonder if Paul had a thorough moral reformation that took place? By the way, to believe that Constantine was a Christian is to, is to absolutely believe that the gospel does not change people thoroughly. Nobody was talking about perfection. What, they're ta what we're talking very plainly about is a new nature, not one that has soul invictus on one side. And not that, that, that dedicates to the, the god of fortune, goddess of fortune. 
which is, by the way, the opposite of faith. The facts, therefore, may, be, may have been these. Before the battle, Constantine, leaning already towards Christianity, is probably the best and most hopeful of the various religions, seriously sought in prayer, as he related to Eusebius, the assistance of the god of the Christians, while his heathen antagonist, Maxentinius, according to Zosimus, was consulting the Sibylian books and offering sacrifices to the idols. Filled with mingled fears and hopes about the issue of the conflict, he fell asleep and saw in a dream the sign of the cross of Christ with a significant inscription and a promise of victory. Being already familiar with the general use of this sign among the numerous Christians of the empire, many of whom no doubt were his own army, he constructed the labrum, or rather he changed the heathen labrum into a standard of the Christian cross with the Greek monogram of Christ. That's what you were looking for. That's what he did. He just changed it. He just changed it. Which he had put on the swords, which he had put on the shields of the soldiers. To this cross standard, which now took the place of the Roman eagles, he attributed the decisive victory over the heathen Maxentinius. So he was believing in a relic. which is still what Roman Catholicism does today. Accordingly, after his triumphal entry into Rome, he had, his, he had his statue erected upon the forum with the labrum in his right hand and the inscription beneath. By this saving sign, the true token of bravery, I have delivered your city from the yoke of this tyrant. Three years afterwards, the Senate erected to him a triumphal arch of marble, which to this day, within sight of the sublime ruins of the pagan Colosseum, indicates at once the decay of the ancient art and the downfall of heathenism and the neighboring arch of Titus commemorates the downfall of Judaism and the destruction of the temple. The, the inscription on this arch of Constantine, however, ascribes his victory over the hated tyrant not only to his master mind, but indefinitely also to the impulse of deity, by which a Christian would naturally understand the true God, while a heathen like the orator Nazareth in his eulogy on Constantine might take it for the celestial guardian power of the herbs of Eternia. What does that mean? It means he made his God generic so everybody would accept him. Right? That's what happened. At all the events, the, vic the victory of Constantine over Maxentinius was a military and political victory of Christianity over heathenism. Political. Political. How do you put military and Christianity in the same sentence like that? The emblem of ignominy and oppression became thenceforth the badge of honor and dominion and was invested in the emperor's view according to the spirit of the church of his day with a magic virtue. It now took the place of the eagle and other field badges under which the heathen Romans had conquered the world. It was stamped on the imperial coin and on the standards, helmets, and shields of the soldiers. Above all military representations of the cross, the original imperial labrum, shown in the richest decorations of gold and gems, was entrusted to the truest and bravest 50 of the bodyguard, filled the Christian with the spirit of victory and spread fear and terror among their enemies which is exactly what we want. Mm. Does that sound like the same gospel? Now listen to this. We're almost done, but you got to hear this because this, this will help you explain. This will help you understand this. From this time, Constantine decidedly favored the church. Through wait, When I say the church... I mean the Catholic Church. He means the invisible church, the invisible, super invisible, universal church. From this, Constantine decidedly favored the church, though without persecuting or forbidding the pagan religions. He always mentions the Christian church with reverence in his imperial edicts and uniformly applies to it, as we have already observed, the predicate of Catholic. For only as a Catholic, thoroughly organized, firmly compacted, and conservative institution did it meet with his rigid monarchical interests and afford the splendid state in court dress he wished for his empire. So early as the, the year 313, we find the bishop 
of Cordova among his counselors and heathen writers ascribed to the bishop even a magical influence over the emperor. I agree. Lacent Lactanius also and Eusebius of Caesarea belonged to his confidential circle. He exempted the Christian clergy from military and municipal duty. Abolish various customs and ordinances offensive to the Christian faith. Facilitated the emancipation of Christian slaves. Legalized bequests of the Catholic churches. And joined the civil observance of Sunday, though not, not as dies domini, but as dies solus. In conformity to his worship of Apollo. And in company with an ordinance for the regular consulting of the horospects. What is that? I missed that one. Somebody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you have kids. All right. Contributed liberally to the building of churches and the support of the clergy. Right? Contributed liberally to the building of the churches in support of the clergy. Does that sound familiar? Erased the heathen symbols of Jupiter and Apollo, Mars, and Hercules from the imperial coins and gave his sons a Christian education. <laughs> the minor, sorry. Not the one he killed, though. <laughs> the mighty example was followed as might be expected by a general transition of those subjects who were more influenced in their conduct by outward circumstances than by inward conviction and principle. The story that in one year, listen, the story that in one year, in 324, 12,000 men and women and children in proportion were baptized in Rome and that the emperor had promised to each convert a white garment and 20 pieces of gold. That sounds like a fundamentalist contest. It is at least in a court. That sounds like the bus minister. <laughs> is at least in accordance with the spirit of that reign, though the fact itself, in raw probability, is greatly exaggerated. I don't think so. So many people have reported this, that 12,000 people, he bribed them with that to be saved or to make a profession. What's that? It was a stimulus package, that's right. Yes. Let's see. Let me see if there's anything else that we do here. I think I might stop there. Goodness. I could keep going all day, but we'll stop. All right. Um, I think you get the gist of it, right? Have I put enough holes in there through his own words to understand that he's not, that he, and his actions, that he wasn't, that's not biblical Christianity? It's never supposed to be done by the sword, right? His remain, let's we'll talk about his death here. His remains were removed in a golden coffin by a procession of distinguished civilians and the whole army from Nicomedia to Constantinople and deposited with the highest Christian honors in the Church of the Apostles. While the Roman, Roman Senate, after its ancient custom, proudly ignoring the great religious revolution of the age, enrolled him among the gods of the heathen Olympus. Yeah. Well, think about this. So he's so he's annoying. Why would the pagan? Why would they do that? If Constantine was this consecrated, strong Christian, why would they do that? Because he wasn't. He was just like the pope. What are they going to do with him? The same thing. That's Pontifus Maximus. Right. He's the head of the priest. Soon after his death, Eusebius set him above the greatest princes of all times. From the 5th century, he began to be recognized in the East as a saint. And the Greek and Russian church to this day celebrate his memory under the extravagant title of Isa Apostolus, the equal of the apostles. Yeah, because I seem to remember all the apostles killing non-believers, slaying people, and ruling with the sword. Do you? The Latin church, on the contrary, with true attack, has never placed him among the saints, but has been content with naming him the great in, ju in just and grateful remembrance of his services to the cause of Christianity and civilization. Now, I want to make sure I sum that up for you. There's one little thing here. I want to make sure I got it, that I explained it to you. 
think I did, but I just want to make sure I didn't leave that out. So his adoption of Christianity. Here's what a Baptist historian says. Constantine's subsequent life was not such as to lead us to credit his account of the divine manifestation. He was a shrewd and unscrupulous politician. No life was sacred if his interests seemed to be re to require its destruction. He had Licinius, treach Licinius treacherously slain after his defeat. The murder of nearly all his relatives, including his nephew Licinius and his son Crispus, seems wholly unjustifiable and could not have been the work of a Christian. The story of the murder of his wife, Fausta, has been somewhat discredited. In general, it may be said that while his character compares favorably with that of the pagan despots and had many admirable and amiable traits, he can hardly be supposed to have exercised a saving faith. He tells the truth, right? Let's see. He abolished various pagan customs, ordinances, offensive to Christians. I said that already. Okay, contributed largely. Basically incorporated Christianity. In 324, again, he is said to have promised to every convert to Christianity 20 pieces of gold and a white baptismal robe. And 12,000 men with women and children in proportion are said to have been baptized in Rome in one year. The persistent adherence of the Roman aristocracy to paganism was a matter of great concern to Constantine. And he took especial pains to overcome the antipathy of the, Roman, the Romans toward Christianity. So anyway... That's what he did. He was Pontifex Maximus, uh, head of the pagan state religion, and he basically he basically um, ruled like a pope. Political and religious spiritual rule. He joined them both together. He did everything the popes do. They all follow in the same spirit, same thing. And you have to ask yourself, is that biblical Christianity or is that some political kingdom that was set up on the backs of biblical Christianity, right? Is that that Antichrist beast Babylonian system that would rise? Because that's what it truly is. And by the way, we haven't even got into his edicts yet or anything else, and we will some other time. His edicts, what he did, and the Donatist. Because the Donatists, what's going to happen is the Donatists are going to rise up from this and they're going to be like, well, you know, we don't really care what you say. They're going to look at Constantine and they're going to say, well, what have we to do with thee? He's going to try to force them to go along with Catholic Christianity and they're going to say no. And then we'll see how wonderful, loving, and kind Constantine is to them. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. Thank you, Lord, also for showing us what biblical Christianity is, that we're not deceived by that spirit of Antichrist, that beast system, that, is, that, that spirit that is already at work today, that mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, that, Lord, took a form, took Christianity and bastardized it, made it something else and mingled it with paganism as Satan's plan all leading up to these end times when that Antichrist will come and Lord we thank you that one day you're going to come and put it all down and you're going to right every wrong and you're going to take care of everything and you're going to conquer and Lord may we preach the gospel to as many people out there as we possibly can for the time is short help many to be saved by the grace of God let us not take the sword and do it, but the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and preach and watch you convict men's souls and see them saved by the grace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.